So a couple of days ago, Variety published a uh, a bombshell article, which was written by Tatiana Siegel. And at this point, pretty much everybody that I engage with in the YouTube space, the podcast space, the pundit space, everybody has had reactions to this article. Even people have been tweeting their thoughts because it had a lot of information that I would say we already sort of knew or we had been speculating about. But it also had a few new things as well that, that sort of shed light possibly on some behind the scenes dealings of certain productions and then just the overall outlook of what's going to happen at Marvel maybe in the next few years. And so we're just going to go ahead and get right into it because there's a lot to really break down and to talk about. And the article itself is called Crisis at Marvel, Jonathan Major's Backup Plans, The Marvel's Reshoots, Reviving Original Avengers, and More Issues Revealed. And before we really dive in, I do want to just urge everybody, as I typically like to do, that we should probably take all of this with a grain of salt. This is written by one person who has their own sources, and I'm not questioning the validity of any of that stuff, but we, of course, know that there are multiple sides and many sides to all of these issues, all of these stories, and as we read things and as we you know, sort of engage with things, we, we typically bring ourselves to what we're reading, mm -hmm. right? That, that includes our own personal bias, our own personal feelings towards a particular thing. So just want to encourage people as they listen to our conversation here to remember that. But if you're not interested in this, we're going to really dive in. I have a lot of thoughts on this. And so use the timestamps if you want to just get to the low key stuff. But uh, let's start off really at the top with where the article starts off. And that's what the Jonathan Majors sort of issue and, 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 and controversy that Marvel is dealing with. And so it starts off talking about how this past September, the Marvel executives, they met up to do their annual retreat for uh, Marvel as a, as a brand to really sort of map out what their plans are going to be for the next few years. And one of the key things that they discussed at this retreat was just what the overall sort of situation and outlook might look like with Jonathan Majors. And they just they discussed backup plans, including which this is, you know, sort of new information, a possible plan to pivot away from Kang the Conqueror as being the primary villain of this new saga and possibly pivoting to Dr. Doom. And that is an option potentially that's on the table. And there's a specific quote here that I do want to read from an insider who talked about, you know, sort of the, the outlook of what this might mean. It says, quote, Marvel is truly fucked with the whole Kang angle, says one top deal maker who has seen the final Loki episode. And they haven't had an opportunity to rewrite until very recently because of the WGA strike. But I don't see a path to how they move forward with him, end quote. Now, this is a Variety article where this guy is saying that Marvel <laughs> is truly fucked. Um, I found that quite hilarious, but. Apparently, this deal maker has seen the final episode of Loki. We know that's going to come out next week. And yeah. I think that the, the the undercurrent of this quote says that something at the end of this show is going to point even more so at Jonathan mm -hmm. Majors and Kang and, and that setup for what's going to come eventually in those two Avengers movies. But now we know with the Jonathan Majors situation, the trial will move forward later this month. There's been some other charges that have been thrown into the mix from London that, that, that have, you know, sort of gotten things a little bit messier. So this isn't going away anytime soon. What are your thoughts just about the potential path forward? This this idea maybe that Dr. Doom could come in and replace Kang the Conqueror as being the big bad of this new phase in this new saga. And if that's not the case, if we don't eventually go down that direction and, and your thoughts on that, then. The Jonathan Major situation, which we have talked about before, but 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 what's your outlook at this point now, knowing that the trial is going to happen and knowing that things probably aren't going to get any easier anytime soon? Man, there's so so much here. Um, and, and Marvel, man, they have been in some crazy, crazy pickles. I think one of the first thing that was interesting that really sparked my like, oh, really? Uh, uh kind of response was, uh, I, I think the part of the article that was that said, um. There was a moment after Quantumania where they already thought about moving away from Kang because of the performance of Quantumania. I thought that was so interesting. I was like, wait, really? And, and again, we got to take all this with a grain of salt. But it still feels like, dang, that one movie was about to make y'all switch completely off of Kang. The con you know what I mean? Like, after talking about this big bad. Um, and, and, and yeah, man, that's just an interesting, I think something i don't know that that statement has an energy in it and i think that overarches all this like is is was kang it is kang it will kang still be it i don't know and it's really hard to tell but it's crazy that that happens if that was a thought before all the jonathan major stuff and then the jonathan major stuff happens it's like oh my goodness like is this really 
happening? Like, is this is this how it's going down? And so I I just think that's really interesting, man. Um, coming in and saying maybe pivoting to somebody else like Doctor Doom, of course to Marvel fans, of course to everybody who knows what Doctor Doom brings to the table would be excited for something like that, right? I mean, Doctor Doom is, I mean, personally, one of my favorite villains in all of Marvel ever. I mean, just the power of the character, what the character can bring to the table. It's a it's somebody we've been waiting for for a very long time. And of course, knowing that Fantastic Four is on the table, something that's coming up very soon, in my mind, I had already slated that to somebody they have down the line, right? Post-Kang is Doctor Doom era after that. And, 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 and so I don't think... Doctor pivoting to Doctor Doom is the worst thing or out of this world. My problem is the fact that you have to pivot to Doctor Doom. Does that make sense? There is energy needed and time needed to bring up somebody as big and as powerful as Doctor Doom. And you're telling me Fantastic Four is not coming out for another couple years. That means there's no Avengers film <laughs> for way past that. Or you know, you know what I mean? There's a lot that has to happen in between there. And so part of me thinks the best way forward, from my point of view, is if all of this happens, just recast Kang. Uh, you know, like, I, I know Marvel hasn't been one to recast a ton, right? Of course, we have Rhodey that's been recasted and things like that. But I I don't know. Personally, I just feel like you should, at that point, you just recast. If you wrote this whole story, if you know Kang the Conqueror is who you've, you've, you've laid it out to be, Part of me is just like recast and maybe we get over it, you know, and maybe Jonathan Majors just can't be that guy right now. Um, and, and, and I feel like I feel like maybe recasting is an easier path forward than rewriting everything you wrote and, and having to, you know, change all of these things and make all of these changes, which. Again, I'm okay if the changes make sense and they do it in a timely fashion. But if we feel like we're in a rush to try to change to a different, uh, uh, a different villain and all of these different things, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's something there that doesn't feel 100 percent like this is what we should do in this moment. But I don't know. I think anything is possible at this point. Um, but the path forward again for me is, is if, if to make it easy, just recast Kang. In all of the day, and maybe you know, figure it out from there. But that's how it feels right now in this moment. And that's also assuming that they would have to rewrite, because who's to say that Doctor mm -hmm. Doom hasn't always been in the plan since the beginning? That is that's still true. very mm -hmm. much a possibility that at some point the pivot could have always happened, regardless of the Jonathan Major situation. If we're to take this article for what it's saying, that decision probably came recently due to the performance of Quantum Mania. But I think, again, we have to remember that that could have always been in the cards. Doctor Doom could have always been introduced in maybe Fantastic Four in the post credit scene and then shows up in Kang Dynasty, takes mm -hmm. over, and then he's the big bad of Secret Wars. We don't know. But if that's not the case, if that wasn't always the plan, I think just recast. If Jonathan Majors does turn out to be you know, pretty guilty in these situations, I don't think that... Right building up all of this character development, all of this work that they've done up until this point, which has been a substantial amount. We've seen him a lot and it's been about three years worth of stuff. I don't think you just completely throw all of that away. I think you would I do agree. more damage and do more harm than good. But mm -hmm. again, they could have always had Dr. Doom and based on like other stuff that I've read, other research that I've done, Dr. Doom has always been in the cards to some degree in this saga. Now, if he's going to be the primary villain, that's, again, another completely separate issue. But from mm -hmm. what I've seen, he has always been at play for being somebody who does have a presence coming as early as Fantastic Four and potentially right. leading to these other two Avengers films. So there's a couple of different routes there. But I think if, if it comes down to brass tacks and this is all like a situation where they have to just go another direction, then just do the recast. Um, let's move on to the Marvel section, which we, we just talked about that a couple of days ago, a lot of the stuff around the Marvels and we did our sort of temperature check, but this article dives in deeper to some additional things that I do want to unpack. Um, and it talks about how the movie had four weeks of reshoots to apparently bring coherence to a tangled storyline. We talk about it all the time. Reshoots and pickups at Marvel is not unusual. They implement it into their production process all the time. So I'm not shocked at that news at all, but apparently Nia DaCosta, the director, eventually stepped away from the film while it was still in post-production, moved to London earlier this year, and also started to begin prepping her next film called Hedda, which is going to be starring Tessa Thompson. Um, this article pointed out that apparently this raised some eyebrows uh, amongst executives at Marvel, and there was a quote specifically in the, in, in the article that says... Uh, 
where is it at actually i'm looking forward oh it says quote if you're directing a 250 million dollar movie it's kind of weird for the director to leave with a few months to go in quote says a source familiar with the production so um i guess again going back to the marvels issue going back to hearing about these reshoots four weeks of it knowing that it is tracking for a very very soft opening um apparently there may have been some um i don't want to say disagreements but there was at least an agreement on Marvel's part to allow Nia DaCosta to go away and work on her next project, which I would assume is the case. I don't think she would just up and leave a, a big movie on that stature. Uh, but then mm -hmm. also the article talks about some test screenings that actually happened earlier this year for the Marvels. And they did something a little bit unusual. They had the test screenings in Texas. And instead of limiting it traditionally to Marvel executives, Disney executives and friends and family, of those of those particular people that work within the company, they actually had a little bit more of a public test screening. And allegedly the results of that test screening were were some of the worst in recent Marvel memory. Yes. And mm -hmm. that prompted a lot of these reshoots. So um, again, as you take all of this, you know, uh, this information in about Nia DaCosta's role and just also the Marvels and where it stands right now on the precipice of its release, what, what's your reaction to this stuff? Wow. Um, why is... I, I just can't understand why this movie is so weird. <laughs> why we're, there's so much weird stuff happening within the production of this film. Um, even if Nia DaCosta and Marvel did, I think, come to an agreement that she would go shoot, you know, the other film that she has going on with Tessa Thompson. Part of me is like, why? You know, and I think there is like that, uh, uh, you know, as a director, you do feel like, I don't know. It does seem like you would see something, you know, through all the way to the end. If they're still doing post-production stuff, it's like, why is that distraction there? And I kind of want to hear, I wish we could like interview Nia DaCosta. You know what I'm saying? Like, what is going on? Like, what is happening? Why, why was the, why was the, uh, the schedule of all this so weird for you? Why did you have to, why did you feel like you had to leave? Or was it, did she feel like Kevin, it was, remember the quote was like, this is a Kevin Feige production or whatever she's saying. Did she feel so much like it was Kevin Feige's baby? She was like, I might as well leave this thing. You know what I'm saying? Or I might as well not even be here and go work on something else that fits my time better. I really want to know. It's like one of those things where I feel like I need to hear from the mouths of the people we're talking about to really understand what's happening. But I do agree, at least to the point that um, it is kind of weird that your director is not seeing through the end or the complete, you know, production of a film. So yeah, it's just a lot of weird stuff in there to me. I wish I knew I could know better what was going on there. Yeah. I think um, if it was any other studio that I heard this about, it would feel weird to me, but just knowing like Marvel's process and the fact that these are Kevin Feige productions, again, I referenced this book very, very recently a lot now because it is just such a tremendous book, but MCU, the reign of Marvel mm -hmm. studios, there was a section in there that really talks about how the sausage gets made at Marvel and how they make their movies. And there was one particular section that discussed how Kevin Feige tells his filmmakers, especially these younger filmmakers, look, you go off, you shoot the movie, you do everything you need to do to get all the footage and the pickups and everything that we need to do, bring it back to us and we'll make the movie essentially implementing and, and insinuating that you film everything that needs to be filmed. You do all of your shots. Obviously mm -hmm. that whole process will be under the purview of the director and the other filmmakers, but the real movie gets made in post-production, which we know has mm -hmm. been just a really a, 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 a piece of their process that, that that's been there essentially since the beginning where they do yeah. a lot of the post-production work to actually craft the movie and the editing bay and the visual effects, all of that stuff is really where they have just like showcased how much power they have in making these movies. The problem mm -hmm. that we've recently seen is that that works in one medium, but it doesn't necessarily translate to another medium like television. And also when you have a certain amount of projects, you can't really mandate that sort of thing across maybe 12 different projects at the same time. There's a quality control issue that I think becomes right. very apparent where Kevin Feige is going to be spread thin. And so this could just be another another case of that where she went and did what she needed to do. And she understood that when it gets back to Marvel in the hands of Kevin Feige, that's really where the magic gets made on their side of things, because they really know the vision. They understand what they want to achieve out of it. They know how it's going to mm -hmm. connect to these other projects coming out. And so I don't think that that's an issue. And again, I think if they came to an agreement that she would leave and she would have the opportunity and time to go off and do something else, I'd be OK with that if that's if that's the agreement that they reach, which, again, I just don't. I don't see any need to cost of just bouncing and leaving right. <laughs> Atlanta to go to London and just like not telling mm -hmm. anybody that, that just it doesn't work that way. And uh, who's to say she couldn't have been in London on Zoom calls and still implementing and giving true. feedback and talking through the process and like show, sharing her notes like that all could have still been happening. But I, I do also think that in general, pulling back from just Marvel and their process. 
you would like to see a director be there. You would like to see them actually having their input and giving their thoughts yeah. and notes in the edit bay. Like that's a very, very crucial process. Movies do really get made in post-production. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. I think to the detriment of what we've seen recently with Marvel, where you're creating time crunches and impossible deadlines. But if there's a lot of work that needs to still come together when you're working with visual effects artists, editors, cinematographers the people who score the movie like all that stuff which is very very Mm -hmm. integral then having the director's vision be present is a very very important piece of it but in general it feels like marvel is not really operating that way i think that they've given that type of power to folks like james gunn you know james gunn he tweets all Mm -hmm. the time about his entire production process you know james gunn is there from beginning oh, yeah. whole time. through the end, whole time. And that's the type of power he wields as a director because his vision is always going to come through. But Nia DaCosta mm-hmm. is a younger filmmaker. She's like 30 or 31 years old. And I think traditionally we've seen them bring in these younger filmmakers who are a little bit more inexperienced with dealing with 200, 300 million dollar budget movies. Then they come in and they have the manpower and the resources to say, like, that's fine. We can take care of that stuff. Now, Nia DaCosta, I don't know if that's really her style of filmmaking. I don't know if she really wants to pursue that anymore, which is why maybe taking that time to go film her next movie and prep that is 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 better for her. That That's mm-hmm. that's probably a better use of her time because maybe she's a little bit more. Uh, maybe she's a little bit more keen to directing those, you know, smaller independent style movies where it is totally her vision. You know, I think she is, you know, truly an artist at the end of the day. So it, it's all a situation that 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 does feel it just feels weird, too, because it does seem at, at some points in this article. And I think just the general discourse around the Marvels is that we're just trying to find a finger to point to blame. Yeah. We're trying to find mm-hmm. somebody who can be the scapegoat of this whole situation, whether it's the box office or it's Brie Larson or Nia DaCosta or, 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 or the shows that preceded it that weren't that well mm-hmm. received. Like now we're pointing fingers before the movies even come out, because I think everybody knows that it's not going to do the numbers and, and, and have the successful performance of what we've previously seen out of the studio. So that's a little unfortunate, but you know, I think that that's just, that's Hollywood shit. You know, there's always somebody to blame Thanks. and there's always Monday mor- morning quarterbacking going on, but um, let's keep moving here. And, and this is really where stuff gets, I think very, very interesting, but a lot of this article is dedicated to the production of blade. And we know blade has been, you know, in some phase of production since 2019, when Mahershala Ali, two-time Academy Award winner, called Kevin Feige and said, I want to make this movie. Now, this article talks about the fact that this project has gone through at least five writers, two directors, and one shutdown six weeks before production. We've discussed many of these different things, but uh, this article dives a little bit deeper and says that one person familiar with the script permutations says the story at one point morphed into a narrative led by women and filled with life lessons. Blade was relegated to the fourth lead. Now, hearing that quote, that's a pretty shocking thing to hear about a Blade movie, like fourth lead, (laughs) a film about women giving life life lessons. Like, that doesn't sound like Blade to me. Like, what movie is that? It's important to know that, again, a lot like a lot of things within this article, there have been a number of statements that have been refuted. And Michael Starberry, who was a writer on a previous Blade draft, actually tweeted out something that I thought was very interesting in response to that particular statement. He says, quote, I worked on a draft of this before the strike. Never saw a version where Blade was fourth lead or it was a, quote, narrative led by women and filled with life lessons. But I suppose a lot could have happened since I had anything to do with it. He was in 99% of the scripts I was a part of. He also continues and says, whatever's going on with Blade, I'm hoping for the best. Some good folks are involved in that joint. Somebody responded and said, you know, if Blade isn't about Blade, then why would we watch it? Michael Starbury responded. He was in almost every scene when I was involved. I don't know what happened, but I'll just say I seriously doubt he was ever the fourth lead in any draft. So, again, going back to Blade, we know that that's been a challenging production. It, it is, it is, you know, trugging along, setbacks, rewrites, change in creative power. All this stuff is really holding this movie up now. Mm-hmm. And Mahershala Ali is not getting any younger What's your response to this, hearing the potential path that might have been taken with Mahershala being a part of this and possibly being the fourth lead to also this article noting that he considered walking away from the project at one point and Kevin Feige, in order to to, to, to curtail that, went to hire the writer of Logan to now come in and write a new draft of that movie, essentially to keep Mahershala around and keep him invested in the project. So what's your overall thoughts and response to, to, to everything happening with Blade right now? I think an important thing to note is that I remember when when Blade was announced, Kevin Feige's like, Mahershala brought this movie to me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I think 
it can be frustrating um, to get caught up in all of this mess when all you want to do, all you're trying to do as Mahersha Ali is make a movie, bro. You know what I'm saying? And now we're losing writers and all of this stuff. We're going through all these changes and directors. And I think it, it eventually is just, it became too much for him. I, I do remember we, us talking about, there was that potential of him wanting to leave at some point. I'm sure it, was, it shouldn't have been that hard. You know what I'm saying? Mahershala, again, at the time, one of the biggest stars in Hollywood. He's, he's coming off Moonlight. He's like, let's make a Blade movie. It should not be this difficult, bro. We are, what, five years five since years that now. was announced? Yeah. Since they was on that stage with the Blade hat? Come on. You know and what I'm saying? it feels like we're not like, any closer to actually getting it at this point. Mahershala Ali is growing in age. <laughs> like, we 49. don't have... We don't have a lot of time. My boy's almost fifty, and so I it's it's not hard to be to understand his frustration for him to want to just move on to something else. Him, Blade was a good idea. We tried. I'm sorry, it's not working out. I'm out. You know what I'm saying? He has other things to do with his time, and he he wants to be part of a ship that's not doesn't feel like it's sinking. I'm sure he wants to leave, and so Blade right now, man, it's uh, it, it's just it yeah, it's just too much. It's just too much happening, and it shouldn't be this hard um the, the only thing i will say i don't like one person familiar with script permutation says that's like a <laughs> let's take that with a grain of salt too because that's a lot going on there um and so i can't believe uh, uh everything out of that p- particular part of the story either narrative led by women felt but like, there's not a lot of women in blade's story you know what i'm saying like it's about blade and so i i just can't believe that's the case it really does feel like they were trying to add a little bit of fuel to the flame and add like some, oh, not only was Blade going through all of these other things, but the script <laughs> had all these other weird things going on with By it. By the that way, it's not a little... Blade movie, right? Like, he you're not even getting that. He was the fourth lead in the movie. Who, where are the other three people? Who are they? <laughs> what are we talking <laughs> about here? It definitely feels like hyperbole. I don't know where that came from. So, again, I, I feel like we should take some of that with a grain of salt. But, um... Shout out to Kevin Feige for trying to put the pieces together. You know what I'm saying? And 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 you can, uh, more than anything, you can always tell Kevin Feige is trying to be about his business. Again, a lot of this is him just being spread to thin, but at least he took out the moment. He went out and got the right, uh, R- Logan Ryder and things like that. At least he is trying. So, again, Blade, it may be in current development hell, but I'm hoping they can steer that, steer that ship clean, man, and, and, and get it on the right path but again a lot too much mess going on but hopefully it's heading in the right direction yeah i mean that that's really a hell of a quote morphed into a narrative led by women and filled with life lessons i mean (laughs) that is like what that is a crazy ass thing in in regards to a blade movie like it it, i'm sorry i'm just i'm gonna be honest (laughs) about this girls y'all can't have blade that's 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 for the fellas like blade <laughs> is for the guys y'all like we got to be real about this shit like that's a vampire movie about yeah. a vampire hunter who kicks all ass it should be it should be really mature and dark and brooding like mm-hmm. we got y'all got barbie y'all got taylor swift like come on <laughs> we gotta we gotta have something still for ourselves now and so when i saw that i was just like no way like that cannot be the case if anybody over at marvel is actually allowing that to happen, then they deserve to not be on the project. And there was something Absolutely. that came out that was interesting about this that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jeff Snyder, who who's on the hot mic, he's a he's a very reputable insider who has a lot of sources. He actually did a show yesterday we're recording this on a Friday. He did a show yesterday saying that there was an executive involved in the making of Blade on the Marvel side who has been let go by Marvel. And so I don't know exactly what happened there. I don't know what's really going on with with that production in particular, but he did say that somebody Mm. has parted ways with the studio because things have not been dealt with in the way that they should to get this movie on track. There's a lot of issues. And he also noted, I watched the show. He said that, you know, this is one of the rare times that Kevin Feige actually raised his voice and got very, very upset and angry Uh at what was happening. And so Uh that says a lot because Kevin Feige doesn't seem like the type of person to yell and raise his voice. So you got him in an uncharacteristic state because this is probably one of the biggest headaches that they've been dealing with. And when you do have Mahershala Ali, who can pretty much command whatever type of script and performance he wants, he has that power. Two Academy Awards in like three years, that says Mm -hmm. everything that it needs to say. And he brought this idea to the studio and they agreed to do it. The guy should have a say in all of this. And I'm sure he does. And I'm sure that they are trying to acquiesce to make sure that he can have this performance that he really wants to see through to the finish line. And so Kevin Feige is doing everything he can to make sure that this happened. He does bring on Michael Green, who's been nominated for an Oscar for his work on Logan. Like 
all hands need to be on deck to make sure that this movie is as good as it possibly can be. Because when mm -hmm. you hear all these stories, when you see all of this stuff come out, the expectations are getting just sky high now. They're, 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 they're getting almost to an impossible standard because right. we also know how troubled the production is. And so it's like, well, y'all keep going back to the drawing board. You've hired all these writers and you've changed directors and, and all of this stuff has happened behind the scenes. So I'm expecting the best possible product on the other side of it. That's really going to be, yeah. be the reality if we ever do get it. And I, I, I hope Mahershala doesn't walk away from it. I hope that there's still a chance that we get him with it. But I will say, if it continues down this path, then just, just leave, my guy, because you can be doing other things with other. your time. Mm -hmm. Like, we can get other great performances from Mahershala Ali. Hey, we tried it. It didn't work. It happens in Hollywood all the time. Shoot. People have passion projects, and they just, you know, they fall by the wayside. DC will take them. <laughs> they sure will. Shit. I mean, Spider-Verse still has them in the animated hey. realm. DC will find something, I'm sure, and get it, get it greenlit and made very, very quickly. Um, there's mm -hmm. also another part of this that I think is interesting that that, that that talks about Blade, but after Michael Green was brought on and now that they're sort of refreshing and, and, and re-going over the script and, and what the movie is going to be, speculation is saying that the movie is going to be made on a budget of potentially less than $100 million, which is a big deviation from what Marvel typically does. Now, again, I don't know how true mm -hmm. this is. Again, coming from other sources and other research that I've done, apparently that is not the case. That is something that Marvel is refuting. Marvel doesn't really make movies for that budget. They 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 kind of swing for home runs every single time. But if that were to be the case, if they were to make this on a on a relatively smaller budget compared to some of their other movies, what do you think about that? Is that the right move, or do you do you think that this actually needs something to the degree of what we've seen in other projects? Those two hundred million dollar plus budgets that, that that we traditionally get. Oh, I think that's the right move. For sure. Um, I actually love the idea of a under a hundred million dollar Blade movie because Blade Blade isn't some crazy cosmic <laughs> you know like he's your friend like he's your friendly neighborhood vampire hunter, is what he is, and that's what he does. And so I, I really don't believe you have to have some crazy budget to make a good blade film. We've been getting vampire movies under fifty mil for you know what I'm saying, for a very long time. I, I really don't feel like uh, uh, it a lot of that has to be put into the budget, and and I would actually be excited to hear that it's a hundred mil or less. I feel like you'd have to put more into the story. Got to put more into uh practical effects, <laughs> not as much uh via visual effects. I feel like there's a lot there that can actually help uh, uh the story of Blade or or, or the the story they're trying to tell with Blade, man. So I, it wouldn't worry me. Um, it actually worries me when they say they would want it to be two hundred million dollar kind of film because that's not. That's not the kind of, again, person that Blade is as a movie. That's not, that wouldn't feel good to me. I wouldn't want Blade to to feel like I'm watching something as epic as the Avengers. You know what I mean? That's not what I want. I really want something grounded. And a lot of times when I hear grounded, at least in the superhero world, I don't need $200, $300 hundred million dollar movie. And so uh, I would like for it to be a hundred million under. I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, I've long thought that, and I, and I say this all the time, we just talked about it in our State of MCU podcast, but the the variety of tones really needs to expand in the MCU, especially on, on, on the part of what Disney and Marvel decides to green light and make. You know, with Deadpool, we know that that's going to be a hard rated R. It's going to be traditional to what Deadpool has been in those previous two movies. I think the same thing should be happening with Blade, and I feel like Blade could have been the perfect opportunity to just make something entirely separate from the MCU. Like this isn't connected yeah. to anything. This isn't really a part of that universe. If they want to draw it in later, sure, go for it. But to make something that is stylistically and tonally just completely different than anything else, I think is a welcome change of pace. Like this should be a hard rated R bloody, mm -hmm. mature, grounded, brooding, dark blade movie. Like that's what it should be. It should be about the street level hero that we know him to be in the comics. You don't, nope. you don't need a ton of money for that. You don't need a lot of VFX. You can do a lot practically. You can focus more on the story and the character and have a smaller cast. Like it doesn't have to be this huge spectacle. And I, I don't mm -hmm. think people are even expecting that from blade. Like the first blade movie with Wesley Snipes is made for like $60 million. I mean, if you ingest it well, for, like for today's 45. money, yeah, maybe even less right. than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. If you if you adjust mm -hmm. it, it's probably like 60 or 70. But like mm -hmm. that movie is is really good. It still holds up because it is about the street level hero and, 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 and everything that he has to go through. And I just don't I don't see a reason to have this budget balloon. Now, will it be made for less than 100 million dollars? I don't think so. I don't think I really don't think Marvel is in the it's business of doing that. They they really put a lot of resources and time and money into their budgets, but it doesn't necessarily also have to be made for two hundred and fifty million. If maybe exactly. we can find 
a medium, like 125 and, you know, 150, I'm still like, okay, that's a lot. You can, you can make it's it for lot. less, but <laughs> if we, if we can find a medium and do it for less than what we're traditionally tip, you know, what we typically see out of them, then I think that that could still be a good place to fall in the middle. Cause you look at the Marvels, it's like 275 right now. And that's, it's probably more, you know, if we're being honest, like that's, that's what's reported, but we always know that these budgets are a lot more than what they actually report. So I, I do hope that they get this project back on track. I do hope that it could be, you know, in a good spot whenever we do hopefully see it. I just, you know, I, I want them to just make really good, smart decisions because the big spending lately has not worked. You don't have to spend as much money and, 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 and expect something to, to, to deliver, you know, a good return for you. If you can maybe, spin back, you know, bring back your resources, do things on a little bit of a smaller scale. And then if it overperforms yeah. and that's an even bigger win, because now it looks exactly. even, it looks even better. We saw that with Joker. Joker costs like 75 million and look what it did. It's crazy amount Blade of money. Blade should not have to cost too much more than Joker. It really it should. should not. It, it should be on a similar, not. about a similar scale. Vampires, yeah, they're, they're, bro, are easy. Makeup is easy. Like, yeah, come on. Practical makeup. And like you said, there's been, I mean, a hundred years worth of movies that have shown vampires can be made on modest budgets. And so, um, yeah, I hope, I hope that that's possibly a, a direction that they go. Um, let's move on to the last section, which is another, again, big sort of meaty part of it, but it's talking about just the future and what, what could happen with, uh, the next Avengers movies. And so the article dives even deeper and talks about that. Their sources say that there have been talks to bring back the original Avengers for another movie. This would include reviving Robert Downey Jr.'s Iron Man, Scarlett Johansson's Black Widow. We know that both of them were killed off in Avengers Endgame, but apparently the studio has yet to commit the, to the idea. And also, if they were to bring back these actors, it's going to be incredibly expensive because Robert Downey Jr., apparently his his salary for Iron Man 3 was $25 million. He's about to get Ooh. nominated for an Oscar, so it's going to be even more than that Facts. if you decide to bring him <laughs> back. So um, it's going to be probably the most expensive movie ever made if they do go down that route. But we have speculated that this could be a route to go, especially knowing the Secret Wars is on the table and on the horizon multiverses here variants mm -hmm. you can literally do anything because nobody is permanently dead in these things right but how do you feel about that being potentially a strategy considering that lately some of these newer characters and newer introductions probably haven't hit and landed the way that they thought you know bringing in some of these supporting characters maybe some of these bench players it just isn't living up to i think the standard of what they're used to and so Maybe we go back to the, the 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 traditional, hey, these are our main characters. These are the Avengers, Iron Man, Cap, Black Widow, whoever else, and potentially have them play a pivotal role in those next Avengers movies. Man, this is so interesting to me. So on, on one hand, I feel I feel I think I'm on both sides of the, of the spectrum here. Part of me likes it. And part of me is like, what the hell are we doing? <laughs> on one hand, this is very accurate to comics, right? We've all watched. I don't know, uh, a TV show that had superheroes in it or read a comic that they just bring back the dead characters. It happens. It absolutely happens. Um, and, you know, and that's that's one of the arguments that's easy to make. Like, this is a comic book movie. You can bring back anybody at any time. We've said it on the podcast several times, too. Like, at any point, anybody can come back. You can literally... True. Uh, uh, who said it? Um, Stan Lee said it. Stan Lee was like, he's back because I wrote it. <laughs> that's why... That's why the character is back, because I wrote it, and I'm the writer, and that's what I decided to do. And that could always be the case. Part of me kind of is like, I mean, if you're backed into that corner and you feel like you need to bring some of them back, I mean, sure, do that, I guess, you know, if you want to. Part of me does not like that, though. Part of me likes the idea of moving forward. I, I, I like characters. I like freshness and newness. And I also like the idea of putting a chapter behind us. And I feel like Iron Man and Black Widow are simply behind us. And part of me doesn't, from the Marvel point of view, it's like, let's bring back the characters that work, right? And then you'll have the consumer, a lot of us saying superhero fatigue, which we've already we've talked about. We don't really think that's a thing, right? It's like mid fatigue. But for me, there, there is a little bit of, uh, I guess Iron Man is back again. We're not doing anything new. You know what I mean? Oh, Black Widow is back again. Like, we couldn't have introduced somebody else. And so if that's to happen and everyone goes and sees the movie, 
part of me is like, you can no longer say superhero fatigue is ever a thing, even though, again, we've already talked about it not being a thing. People can never say that ever again because you went back and seen the same shit that they <laughs> that they produced. And so, I don't know. I think there's a lot there. Again, part of me is very really against it, but part of me would also understand it from a point of view of Marvel of like, if, if that's where the money is, if people really come back to the theater to see these characters, then that's what that's what it is. I kind of understand that too. I'm happy they haven't gone through it yet. I'm happy they haven't landed on it. But I can't hate the idea based off the numbers. I really can't. You know what I'm saying? It's like it is what it is. So yeah, it's it's weird. So what I'll just quickly say before I really dive in, this is going to happen. Like it, bottom line, it's gonna happen. Whether or not people like Robert Downey Jr. and Scarlett Johansson want to come back is a different mm. conversation because who says they even want to come back? Robert That's Downey true. Jr. has kind of moved on. He clearly had a phenomenal time making Oppenheimer and he's about to enjoy some tremendous success. I still think he's going to win the Oscar. Scarlett Johansson so went through a lawsuit with Marvel, very ugly public lawsuit. So I don't even know if she wants to deal with that anymore, but I do think they're going to reach out to them 1000%. They've already been doing it. We already saw mm -hmm. Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield come back. We already yeah. know Hugh Jackman as Wolverine is going to come back. We know the other X-Men Fox characters will be coming back. They've been doing this already. So to think that they're yeah. not going to reach back out to these legacy characters and bring them back, it's kind of crazy to me. People have to remember that this is always a bigger picture than just these fucking movies. It's all about mm -hmm. merchandise. It's about theme park rides. It's about attendance. It's about the billions and billions and billions of dollars that are on the line outside of what is accumulated at the box office. That's just the facts of it. And I think another potentially sad reality is, is that with this new phase of characters, they just haven't hit the same like they probably thought that they would. Shang-Chi, good movie, but where have we seen them since that movie? Nowhere. They haven't utilized them. Eternals, very mixed reviews. People pretty much didn't like that and are not gravitating towards that team of heroes. And then on the Disney Plus side, Miss Marvel, Moon Knight, She-Hulk, all mixed to very divisive reviews and reaction to those characters. Who's really excited about their appearance in other projects mm -hmm. outside of diehard fans of those characters? And... Right. They are supporting characters. They have been in the comics. Like, yes, they lead their own stories, but that doesn't always translate to live action when you're talking about these much bigger projects, these TV shows, and these movies. That That's why DC has always gone back to fucking Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman. We know why. They work, they work all the time. They always will work. The same can be said about Iron Man, Captain America, the original Avengers, and then Spider-Man, obviously, and eventually X-Men, which will come to fruition at some point. And so... I I'm I'm not going to be naive about it and think that that's not a possible path for it because it absolutely is. What I will say though is that if they were to bring them back for Avengers whether it's Secret Wars, Kang Dynasty or a combination of both, cool. I'll be excited about that. Why not? Even though it is so soon after the Infinity Saga and we we parted ways with them. But then what comes next? What do you do after that? Like you're going to do something for a pretty big pop a huge box office number. It's going to get folks excited and interested, but will that be sustainable afterwards? No, because Robert Downey Jr. is not going to sign a 10-picture deal. Scarlett Johansson is not going to sign a 10-picture deal. They're going to come back for that one time, get a massive payday, and then leave again until maybe 10 years later they call them back in their fucking 60s and 70s, you know, and they're still on, on walkers and canes playing these, these superheroes. Like, <laughs> my question is, what do you do after that? So at a certain point, you do have to have some responsibility as storytellers to get mm -hmm. us excited about these new characters, to get us invested, to make them feel as big of a deal as yeah. as it was when Iron Man was introduced as Captain America. Because we can't forget that Iron Man, Cap, all of those were B-listers before the MCU. Like they weren't yes. they weren't the heavy hitters. It was all about Spider-Man and X-Men. And then they brought mm -hmm. in this other motley crew of people that made up the Avengers and they made us care about them. And now they are the biggest characters. And they did it again with Guardians of the Galaxy. That formula hasn't translated to these newer characters because I think we are getting deeper and deeper into the well. We're talking about C-list and D-list and like people that just nobody is familiar with. So it's going to be a lot more challenging. So you have to figure out that balance of what are we going to do to service the story and get people invested in the new path forward? But then mm -hmm. is there a way to still creatively pay tribute and homage to the past? Because you have to have Iron Man and Captain America. Like you, you got to have those characters. So maybe it's about recasting. Maybe you just like start over. Maybe Secret Wars is the big reboot and we just kind of start from scratch all over again. But, you know, I, I think I think that there's, you know, there's there's going to be challenges with that for sure. And, and they have to figure that out. But the article kind of ends on a little bit more of a positive note before we close out here. And it talks about, again, things that we've discussed, the possible path forward and what that all might look like. 
And really towards the end of it, it talks about, you know, what may really reinvigorate Marvel in the future, of course, is what they have on the table potentially with X-Men and Fantastic Four. Now that those mm -hmm. two stables of characters are back under their control, obviously Deadpool 3 is on the horizon. We know that that has big implications potentially for the mutants. Fantastic Four, Marvel's first family, that could be a seismic shift in terms of direction and who we focus on. So, you know, what do you feel about that, you know, in terms of, Obviously, things are in a shaky state now. Like, it, it's it's really, it's there. Like, I don't know if crisis is the word, as this article points out, but it's a very shaky state at Marvel. Is this all just a matter of not if, but when? Like, when we will be able to get back on track because we do have Marvel Fantastic Four, we do have X-Men. I don't know. Do you ever foresee that they could get back to the place that they were with the heights of the Infinity Saga and the run-up until Endgame? Or could it be still good stuff? On the horizon, it just may never, ever get back to that place of being literally the the the, the dominant force in pop culture that everybody talks about. Hmm, you know, this, this is a very interesting question. I think they're down and not out for sure. Baseline. I think they're down right now. For I mean, very clearly they're down. But I don't think they're out. In fact, I do think some of the best days that we will see in Marvel are still upon us. I don't know if they'll ever be the juggernaut that they were in in that phase three bro it's just something they was firing on all cylinders and that thing i don't know what was going on and i think some of that might have been lightning in the bottle but i don't think that's over either knowing some of the projects that we have in front of us and some of the slate that we see in front of us imagine a world where they go on a streak right fantastic four is fire the avengers films are fire let's say blade finally comes out that's fire. you know what I mean? there's still a lot there um and then and then they say hey here's an x-men movie you know what i mean like th there could still be a lot of greatness uh, uh there again on the horizon and on the table but I, it, it's it's just hard to see right now the vision is a little blurred i think that's all and i think um again very weird analogy but it, you know what i'm saying we got marvel need to go get their eyes checked and get some put some glasses on it's really what's happening they could see before not so much anymore it's time to get some glasses and i think once their vision is back we'll be able to to get on a better path you know what i mean and so i think i think all this is possible i think all this can be cleaned up again i have to say uh i'm very glad they do have somebody like kevin feige you know what i'm saying who can who who is yelling like i feel like that's a check for everybody like <laughs> like that should be like everybody that works with marvel right now should be y'all kevin feige yelled like that should be like everybody looking around the room like there's a problem in this bitch <laughs> like let's get it together and i think that will absolutely be the case man and, and again a lot of these articles we are seeing it's not like everything is all bad right we me and you we just got done talking about how they will hire some tv executives you know what i'm saying to make it for better tv we are hearing at least some of these things like oh kevin feige's trying to course correct for blade we are hearing you know what i mean some of these things trying to be rectified and fixed and and i, I don't think it's all bad this is a snapshot of what's been going going on recently but i'm not going to fault and say marvel isn't doing anything about it i think that's the thing like it's not like they're not they're just sitting with their hands tied behind their back it seems like they are actively at least for the most part of what i'm listening they're they are still trying to fix a lot of this stuff so i can't say it'll they'll never be what they were i i really can't say that yet now in a couple years when again some of these big projects come out and if that the, uh, to me those are the indicators fantastic four goes down oof that's like, you know what I'm saying? You can't you can't mess up Fantastic Four. I think low-key, that's like one of the milestones for me. Like, if you mess that up, you're, you Marvel might be down for real. Like, <laughs> all right, like, y'all, it's time to reboot or it's time to restart. But I think there's a lot of greatness still on the horizon, and I think they can get back to the juggernaut that they once were. I really do. I'm not... I'm not saying that they don't got work to do. They definitely do, but I, I, I'm not giving up hope yet. I think there's still a lot to be done. Look, the reality is no franchise stays on top forever. It just doesn't happen. Everybody has their day. Everybody eventually runs into roadblocks and challenges. Just look at the history of Hollywood. That's always been the case. And people have zeitgeist moments where they are the dominating force in pop culture. And then eventually somebody else comes and takes the mantle. I think that's what's happening with Marvel right now. But that is not to say that they still can't achieve success and produce good things in the future. I do think that there is a lot to look forward to on the horizon. 
obviously X-Men and Fantastic Four are big, big projects. And it's a shame that, you know, again, another revelation from the MCU book is that Kevin Feige had to announce Fantastic Four before it was even ready. He was forced by Disney executives to do it at that Disney investor day to, to, mm-hmm. to talk about a project that it wasn't even prepared to talk about, which we know he doesn't like to do that. And so we're kind of stuck in this in this loop of hearing about a, a movie that wasn't even intended to be announced as long ago, uh, ago as it was. And so we've just been mm-hmm. waiting and waiting and waiting. But when it eventually does come if it's great then that's going to be a good sign x-men there's a lot there there's a lot you can do there that opens up a new world of possibilities there's a lot that you can do to do there and so i think that there are still great successes great days ahead for marvel i don't foresee that they'll ever get back to the level of what they were though i think that that is um it, it probably will never be replicated again in hollywood history like that run 30 films almost, or excuse me, 23 films in the Infinity Saga. You have the highest grossing film of all time, essentially with Avengers Endgame, billion dollar film after billion dollar film. That, that it wasn't sustainable and it's just really unprecedented to have that type of run. Nobody has literally ever done it ever. And, and I just don't, I can't see any other franchise that would ever do it again because you look at the second or third best, like they're not even close. Like Marvel is by far and away the most successful entity in Hollywood history. And so to ever achieve that level again, even if you are the studio that once did it, is asking a lot of anybody because we've never seen anything like that. So I don't think they'll ever get to that level. I don't think they'll get to the end game level of what they were. I think that 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 time is done, but that is okay though. That's not to say that they still can't have great days ahead. Look at other studios. Walt Disney Animation Studios has been around 100 years. They have had ebbs and flows all the time. They started off hot, producing classic after classic. They had a really bad period in the 70s and the 80s. Come back, 90s Disney Renaissance, great time. Everybody loves it, hitting everything out the fucking park. 2000s, not a great time. And then they come back in the 2010s and, and, and now into this new age, and they're in a bit of a better position. This is how studio and movie making works. Everybody goes through ebbs and flows. And so we might be in a bit of a lull and a down period now with Marvel, but I think it'll eventually it'll rise again. It just, you know, $2.8 billion at the box office. I mean, that that just never happens. It, it happens, you know, all but two times, essentially what we've seen. And so I think it's asking a lot. And, and I think that the way this article ends, is it's very telling, you know, uh, Jason Squire, he's a professor emeritus at USC School of the Cinematic Arts. He said that Kevin Feige, is the Babe Ruth of movie executives and Marvel has the most profitable track record in movie history. No question. And I agree. I I think that 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 is absolutely a a truthful statement. They will win championships in the future. They might not be the most, the most unequivocal championships in their history. They might not be the most, you know, dominating performances of all time. It might be Michael Jordan in 98, you know, it might be, you know, on the way out, like he isn't, he isn't mm-hmm. what he was in 92, but they can still win. They can still pull out big victories. And so I think that that's what, what's on the horizon for Marvel. But folks, those are all of our thoughts on the crisis at Marvel article from variety. If you've read this article, if you have thoughts about the state of the MCU, definitely hit us up and let us know what you think.